Learning with Lowell. I am your host, Lowell Thompson. This podcast is first and foremost about learning. We will learn about the different avenues for success in biotech, healthcare, and related science fields through conversations with startups, researchers, and policymakers, CEOs, experts, you name it. We're going to have it on this podcast so you can learn about the different ways people are achieving things in the industry and how you can do the same. Or just learn about great science topics. I consider there are two main types of episodes. The first type is what I consider a case study or mini biographies where I communicate with a person about a specific topic, usually what they're trained in or have experience in, so you can get a sense of who they are, what they do, and what they're passionate about. And that usually comes with a a lot of advice at the end. The second type is a symposium topic, or a group topic where I interview a bunch of guests around a central theme, such as like how to get venture capital for a biotech company, how to affect change in Congress. That's going to be a fun one how to eradicate an illness. Tune in every Monday for email blasts if you've signed up for them at my website, Learning with Lowell, to get book recommendations, website recommendations. You know, really, you're going to get a lot of content from that every Tuesday for new episodes. And every Thursday, I'm going to do a blog post as well. And we have a Facebook, a Twitter. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn. Basically, device connects to the internet. You'll be able to get these podcasts. Please leave a review and tell everyone, please and thank you. Today we have Don Falco of Deep Science Ventures, one of the founders. He and I get into a great conversation about the things that he's really passionate about, you know, finding people in their early careers and giving them opportunities that most people wouldn't. You know, there's gray hair fallacy in the biotech space, and they have a very unique value proposition at Deep Science Ventures that I think everyone's going to kind of like. And if you are interested in learning more like che- definitely check them out because they apparently sponsor visas but they we get to that at the end but for everyone i think you're going to get something from this you're going to learn about you know science you're going to learn about you know missed opportunities you're going to learn about uk development i mean there's a lot of really neat things here i i generally enjoy it and you get a lot of historical uh context uh dom and i have a fun conversation uh talking about history at one point that i think anyone will enjoy and there's a, a lot of book recommendations surprisingly so I hope everyone enjoys this, and if you have any comments or feedback, please send them my way. Thank you. How did you get into Deep Science Ventures? Like, I think in our previous conversation, you mentioned that you kind of found someone who, like, you're you're one of the founding partners, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. And so I'm kind of curious, like, how did you find yourself in such a position? That makes it sound like it kind of happened to me. I, I guess to some extent it sort of did. So I started off uh, thinking that I wanted to get involved in political philosophy. So I was interested in social impact and engineering change at the fastest speed possible. And I thought the way to do that was politics and economics. And so I studied politics, philosophy, economics. And it was realizing that that was a bad way of changing things that led me to look into startups. And then as soon as I looked into startups, it made me realize that the most interesting thing in startups was uh, scientific innovation. And so I took a role at Imperial College and my job there was managing a portfolio of early career scientists and and engineers and running a pre-accelerator there called the Venture Catalyst Challenge. Um, And it was working with those startups that I realized that there was a huge misperception of the capabilities of those entrepreneurs and that someone needed to do something about that misperception um, and so myself and a colleague, Mark Hammond, who'd set up the Venture Catalyst Challenge, we left together to start Deep Science Ventures to, to, to right that wrong. What was the disparity you guys noticed that made you want to branch out? So I was working in um, an 80-person organization, had a fund of several, uh, several hundred million pounds, and it was investing in tens of companies a year, but it wasn't investing in any of the companies that were being produced by these early career researchers. So that's a quite stark contrast. So if you were a professor starting a company, it would be relatively easy to go and raise investment. But if you're a PhD graduate or a postdoc with, a, with 10 years of research under your belt and even a couple of years of industrial experience, it'd be significantly harder. And that didn't seem to map into outcomes. So the willingness to invest didn't map into the likelihood of success. So, for example, whilst we were working at Imperial, just over the three and a half years that I was there, five of the companies I worked with, I worked with about 75, 80 companies, five of them went on to exit to multinationals. So one sold to Spotify, one to Google, one to Apple, one to Osevier. And that, those kinds of exits, they were in one, in one sense disappointing and in another sense 
uh, exciting and a sign of, of what was possible. They were disappointing in the sense that those companies, they were exiting within a couple of years, and so they probably could have been 10 times as big, but the lack of funding meant there's no, there was no fuel for, for them to get that big. So selling the company is pretty much the only way to progress to a, to a meaningful, you know, a meaningful financial event for those founders because they can't raise the capital to grow it. But, but either way, you know, that those are both disappointing. If you have a small number of funders in the space, they're, they're going to depress the valuations of those companies and the dilution for the founders is going to be greater. And the founders can't negotiate that they should be topped up each round because there's no negotiating power because that comes from um, availability of funding, right? If you have a large number of potential funders, you can leverage that into maintaining your share in the company as a founder. But there aren't a huge number of investors willing to take risks at the early stage for science companies. And so that dilution happens that way as well. A question I have back at the original fund, you said you had like something like several hundred pounds, several hundred million pounds of available funds to invest. It was 350 million. Wow. Okay. So two questions. One, how did you convince people to let you manage that? That was so that was the firm that I was working at before I left. So that's um, a company called Touchstone Innovations that doesn't exist anymore. Um, and that they, they got that through a public listing. So they were on the alternative investment market in the UK. So that wasn't the fund that we were managing. But, and it was out of frustration of how that funding was allocated towards senior academics rather than early career researchers that led me to leave to start DSV, which is a, it's a smaller fund because we're, we're a year and a half old. I remember reading this book, I think I mentioned I, I mentioned it last time, called Venture Deals by Bradfeld. And he talks about how you invest at the early round, and then if the company has to raise more money, you have to you either have to invest more money or you have to have like the contract set up so you don't get diluted down. So if you don't have available capital, you can't do that. I keep wondering, what do venture capitalists do with their excess money not be diluted, if that makes sense? Like I just like do they just like put in a bank? Like I just I just imagine like lots of money is sitting for these situations that arise like three to four, five years in the future. Depends on the structure of the fund. And I, I, I don't, I can't talk for all fund structures because there's quite a lot of different available options. We're, we're a particular type of, it's actually quite a rare type of fund structure called uh, a nominee vehicle, which simply means that the funding exists in the bank accounts of the investors and it's legally allocated. And upon investment decision, they make the investment. So, so, so yes, it's in a bank account, but it sits in their bank account. So, um, that's that's how nominee vehicles work. In some cases, like with um, with the previous fund I was working at, it it invested off balance sheet, which means that yeah, it sat in the company's account effectively. And there's and there's other ways of doing it as well. I I, I can't talk I can't talk from extensive experience in different types of fund structure. I'm afraid. Oh yeah, that makes sense. I was just kind of curious within the pie slice that you 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 have experience because it's just. Because I was reading about it, I was like, what do, what do people do? Like, how do they manage that? <laughs> it's like, it seems like you'd have a lot of floating capital somewhere. The, the way it sometimes works is that the funding is committed and it's drawn down into the fund in tranches in much the same way that a startup would draw down an investment round into tranches. Uh, and that's just a way of ensuring that there's not lots of, you know, um, liquid capital sitting in a bank account and not accruing any kind of uh, increase in value so that they can do something with it. And, it, and you normally do that on a, on a fixed schedule so that it's predictable so that the investor can make the capital available just before it's required to be drawn down so i think that's 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 another typical way in which it's done makes sense yeah that that clears up my confusion and and question because it's i imagine just leaving money in a bank account and so i always think investors must have a better way of (laughs) housing their money so thank you for answering that the so jumping to back to deep science ventures you bunted off with hammond which is a really cool name so you're about a year and a half into it. What has that year and a half been like? Like, I imagine there's been a lot of learning, you know, some trial and errors to some extent. But I'm just kind of curious, like, how has that been for you? Yeah. I mean, a year and a half, it doesn't really capture the whole journey because we did start looking at it before we left. And we went through a lot of iterations of the approach before we started. So we did a large scale internal scoping exercise where we looked at all the different models we could use. We weren't actually committed to starting a fund in the first place. We were interested in starting potentially a large-scale philanthropic organization. And the challenge that we ran into with something philanthropic was that impact investors can sometimes be even more risk-averse than venture capital investors. So 
part of the reason being that there's lower expectation of return or no expectation of return. And so they want to be sure that the money allocated is going to make an impact in some way. Um, another model that we looked at was uh, funding it entirely through corporate sponsorship. But we found that what the companies that we spoke to wanted to work on, what, what they wanted us to solve, weren't necessarily the most exciting opportunities we could think of. And that opportunity cost was just too high to tolerate. We had so many ideas of what we would uh, like to explore with, with new ventures. And so there's a lot of up and down where we had these really what felt like watertight um, value propositions that we'd go to these amazing people, CEOs and CTOs of multinational firms. And you get a little bit starstruck when you're just another employee in another firm and you're talking to the CEO of some, of some multinational. And then, and then you, you find out that it's not going to work. And so there's a lot of pain uh, of, of kind of, of working out how we could get it to work. And then we had just one incredible meeting where they completely understood what we were doing and that unlocked the whole investment round. And so that you get that up. And then we were, <laughs> uh, and the, the kind of, the weird thing about what we did is that meeting, it came after we'd already started. So that we'd already been, we'd already quit and been working on paid for a couple of months at that point. We were self-funding some of that ex exploration. And we actually decided to make the slightly rogue decision of setting up as if we were definitely going to raise. So we'd started recruiting for our program. We'd started, we put up a website. We'd started advertising. Uh, but we didn't have any money to invest. So we took a, a fairly large reputational risk kind of a reputational investment to get it off the ground. Um, and luckily, I think I think if we hadn't done that, we wouldn't have closed the, the fund because it, it was partly the traction we got through that advertising and the sorts of people we were able to attract that allowed us to raise. Uh, and it would have taken us much, much longer if we hadn't if we hadn't got going. Uh, but obviously, it could have all fallen through. So it was fairly tense and stressful for us at that time. And then uh, I guess the most interesting part of that was speaking to potential founders who we wanted to start with and that was the most validating experience that gave us the energy to carry on going because we'd meet these incredible grads who didn't necessarily have ideas but they're still uh, exceptionally passionate and driven and they had these incredible stories about things that they built before and we just could not wait to get going to start building companies with them so that was you that's kind of like a little bit of an insight into how what we went through up and down uh, it's, it's something that's going to be really inspiring in the sense that th throughout history, well, I, I keep thinking of the Greek war with Troy where Agamemnon burnt all the ships to make his soldiers fight harder. <laughs> it's basically what you guys did. You know, you, you take that leap and you can't, you can't go back. You know, you can't, you can't unburn those ships. So you got to get into that, the, that walled city and you did it. And you know, that, that desperation and all that comes along with doing an act like that kind of brings you to a whole new level. Like I, I can't, I, I imagine you felt for lack of a better term, much more alive and engaged in pushing the envelope to get the funding, to get the, the founders. Once you make the decision and you push yourself out there and there's no going back, like that means you can invest fully. And to some extent, I think sometimes people kind of lifeboat it where they keep a foot in a different, different arena or something like that so they can go back easily. So I think that's like definitely, you know, to echo your point, like one of the reasons that you guys were able to close and to start doing the things you, you really care about because you made that leap, you believed in yourselves and then it's easier for people to believe in you. I, th I think that's a pretty edifying comparison. Agamemnon, that's a, it's an incredible comparison. It didn't feel like that at the time. Every time something didn't work, it just felt like we were being really foolish and we'd taken an unnecessary risk and that we were going to disappoint a lot of people, but it didn't feel like for death. <laughs> um, but I appreciate the comparison. It's an incredible reference. The thing is, whenever you do something and it works out, you're great. People are inspired by you. Whenever you do something and it doesn't work out, people are like, well, you're stupid. Why didn't you do a better job? <laughs> but it's equally inspiring. The things that do work out and don't work out should inspire everyone to do differently because you can't take what another person has done to be successful and apply that to your life because you're like, I'm not Dom and you're not Lowell. The way in which we were going to go about the world is entirely different. So it's good to get from a wide variety of things. To jump to my next question, stop complimenting you with stories of, which I don't know how much of a compliment that is because he burnt down a really nice city, but then we got the Romans. <laughs> yeah, I haven't gotten a comment. <laughs> it's a fun fact for people who are listening. The Trojans, after being burnt down by Agamemnon, fled to Italy, and that would become the Roman state. Fun fact. So, where, 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 can we, where can we go to learn more about that story? What's the best reference? It's either Livy, Ptolemy, but yeah, there's some really good, there's, like, if you really, it's more, it's kind of like pseudo-mythology, like, the Romulus and Ramus were raised by wolves, and there's, like, some stuff that's, like, 
fanciful where they're talking about how like Roman gods were there or like gods were there during fights and stuff. But you can kind of thread through to see the larger point that went on. You were, we were talking about how you went about, you know, messaging like 30 people a day, making phone calls like to a huge extent, something like 2000 applications in the first year. What 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 was your partner uh, Hammond, if I remember his name, what was his role in all this? What was Mark Hammond's role? So, so Mark is the scientist of the two of us. So he did a um, PhD in neuropharmacology and artificial intelligence. And so I, I mean, as an as a team, there were just really there were two of us and, and a couple of people helping. Mark was doing all of the technical due diligence. So basically, if I needed to understand whether or not this person was a good scientist, whether or not their papers were impressive, whether or not the patent they filed was was interesting or relevant or was going to make a difference in the world, it, it, that was Mark. Um, and because it was the early days, Mark and I were working really closely on everything. So the the construction of the investment of the of the criteria as to when we were going to select people for the program that was a that was a um, a long effort that we did together in terms of compiling the different characteristics from the literature um, and program design uh, managing. Managing and tying down all of the investment stuff, Mark just owned that. It's like a grenade trying to get all of the investment documentation lined up and all of the legal sorted. Uh, and Mark has an eye for technical detail in a way that I just don't. And I get super impatient if I can't work out what's going on in a clause, whereas Mark is willing to kind of sit down and nail it down. So we've very contrasting personalities in that sense, and it worked quite well. well is he helping you kind of like seeing other people that are great at something that you're you know, something that you struggle with, are you like internalizing any of that and like trying to push yourself to learn like how to do those type of things or just uh, learn, like pr- improve yourself? That's a great question because that those two impulses are constantly in tension for me at least, whether or not I should be specializing or whether or not I should be improving generally. And and overall, we tend to specialize and, and delegate, but there are some things where it's really important that we both know how to do them. So increasingly, I'm involved in, uh, so for for the last, this is really embarrassing actually, for the last uh, 12 months or so, Mark has looked after all of the finances for Deep Science Ventures. And I'm just getting to understand, so for example, today after this podcast, I'm going to run payroll. (laughs) And it'll be the first time that I've ever done it. Uh, Mark's been doing it consistently up to this point. And so we're starting to share some of this responsibility because apart from anything else, it it makes uh, operational sense to be able for, for us to both be able to do it because if he goes on holiday then no one gets payroll and that's just so inconvenient so it's a mix of uh sharing some admin stuff and, and and otherwise specializing on on software it's not operationally dependent is there anything that you're working on that you're like i want to be better at this i want to push myself to this new height um you know read books what have you what do you have anything like that so that's a, that's a constant process at the moment the thing that i'm really focusing on is understanding what makes a good venture capital fund and that that's obviously a multifaceted project it involves trying to understand how people justify them having someone else's money to make allocation decisions it involves trying to understand what the burden of evidence is on you as a fund manager when you're when you're presenting to 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 LPs that you should be the one who manages that funding it's about trying to understand um where there is where there is really a lot of good um a lot of uh, a lot of good practice for ven- for venture capital and where it's missing in terms of industrial sectors and that's a that's something that if I'm honest we I didn't know a, hu- a huge amount about which is which is again a pretty embarrassing thing for someone who's been involved in running a fund for for over a year uh, and that that that's all necessary knowledge because we're currently we're currently fundraising ourselves so it all feeds into debt construction for us which looks very different from the way a normal startup deck would be. That there isn't a lot of money when it comes to early stage biotech. So, do you use other, like maybe tech early stage, or uh, like uh, like like a place like Y Combinator or or other industry, like how they look at things to kind of, or like how do you go about learning these things? Yeah, so that <laughs> that that's why it's hard because there aren't a huge number of decks for for pre seed investors, especially not in the in the science space. And that's one of the arguments that we tried to make in the deck is that there should be more funds like that. What surprised me when I looked at um, decks for decks for funds was how much time they spend justifying the existence of venture capital as an asset class. It's kind of like if a startup spent half their deck trying to explain that startups were a good place to put money in general before they started explaining that their startup in particular was a good place to put money. That's the that's one of the things that really surprised me when I started looking at other other fund managers' decks because they 
there's a, a group insecurity and a, and a general um, up and down trend as to whether or not people think about venture capital as a good asset class. Um, so that's one of the kind of interesting learning points for me. And, and we, have, we have to go through that motion as well with, with us. So it's kind of there's so much you have to do in, in the same number of slides. You've got 15 slides. You have to explain why venture capital is good. Then you have to explain why biotech is good and other scientific disciplines are good. And then you have to explain why the early stage is good. And then you have to explain why you are good. <laughs> uh, it's like a telescope. It, <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of content to get across. So that's, um, that's been really interesting. And I'm doing that in parallel to, to helping our cohort write their decks as well. So it's a good time to be reflecting. Sometimes it makes you feel a little bit like a charlatan. You look, Going away and reading about how to write pitch decks and then going and telling your portfolio how they should be writing their pitch decks. But um, it's, been a, it's been a useful process and a reflective process. So it's not that there's a lack of support for venture capital as an industry. There's a lot of support, government level, multi-government level. So at the, for example, at the Europe level, there's a huge amount of support for it. Rather, it's that the data is ambivalent as to whether or not venture capital is a good way of investing your money. And you're making a case to people who don't solely invest in venture capital. They have a choice as to whether or not they invest in real estate or whether or not they invest in, um, in, you know, in, in, in tracking the success and failure of nations, <laughs> depending on how much money they've got. Um, whether or not they put the money in a, in a, in a tracker account that, that looks to match whatever the national, um, stock exchange is doing that there's a lot of there's a lot of choices and venture capital is just one of them and, it, and it's not even a it's not even a particularly large choice and it's perceived in general as a slightly more risky um and then there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of the possible funds you can actually invest in so even if you're convinced that venture capital makes sense there's a lot of difference between different types of fund manager so uh yeah there's it's, it's, a, it's a it's a long story to tell and if you think about it from the perspective of what venture capital funds are doing it I think it's justified that it, that LPs would be skeptical about VC as, a, as an asset class because you have to employ a bunch of people to think about where to put your money, and that activities are really not that efficient. They're, if you think about what venture capital um, partners do, that they're, they're, they're taking meetings, they're having investment committee meetings, they've got these expen- they've got these expensive offices. There's good reason to be skeptical that it's the most efficient use of your of your money when you could just put it into a house. The house is definitely going to accrue in, in value if the last 10 years have got anything to say about it and uh, then someone's going to buy the house for more than it cost before and, and what what is the risk with that transaction it's unlikely that you know in the same way that a company goes bankrupt that the house is going to get hit by a meteor um so there's so there's i think that i think the skepticism is justified and it, and if that skepticism didn't exist then a lot a lot of venture capital fund um would get a lot would get pretty um get pretty lazy with this kind of stuff so yeah it's it's a good but nevertheless, if you, the other thing that surprised me is that venture capital um, funds are so undifferentiated. So they're really, they're really very similar to one another in the end. And I think that might reflect the fact that because they're so different from one another, one another investors in, their, in those funds look to put the money in, in several different funds. And so it doesn't actually matter that they're um, different or not. So, yeah, it's, it's a completely different attitude um, to, than, than to, to investing in startups where you, want, where you really want all of the different startups to be different from each other. Our, I mean, our pitch is mostly about how individual siloed scientific innovation is, is kind of declining in productivity, to be honest, and how it's really the most interesting thing is opportunities at the intersection between different disciplines. And that's where you really see these huge step changes in, in, in productivity capability. Um, that's really where the next frontier is, probably. And biotech today looks different from how it looked 10 years ago. And so the arguments don't make then they're not the same. Um, drug drug discovery is less productive, significantly less dr- productive. Um, chemistry, you know, we're, we're finding we're finding less results per dollar of R and D spent, even though the number of research is increasing. So the argument I'd make instead is science is becoming increasingly similar in terms of risk profile to engineering, in that a lot of scientific innovation is driven by engineering and driven by the underlying improvements in technology that are being enabled by improvements in engineering. So um, increased cap- capability in compute, increased um, co- um, increased efficiency in sequencing, producing different proteins, increased efficiency in measuring healthcare, generating data. That, that kind of thing is driving an ever-falling risk profile in life sciences and natural sciences as well. So if you include um, physics as well. So the, that, that's, the, that's the argument that we try and make. Uh, and, and, and it's a selfish argument. Most of our companies are produced at the intersection between different disciplines as well. So 
An example would be we have a company that is able to identify a specific antibody for a given target in a day when before it would take you 18 months and you'd have to do it by trial and error. And so that's that's 120 times faster roughly um, than even the best practice, which is it can get down to as much as four months. You can do it as quickly as four months, but it's still trial and error. They can do it entirely in silico, and that's purely cap- that's purely um, made possible by our improvements in engineering. So really, that convergence is what's really exciting, I think. And a lot of people are waking up to that. The idea of computational biology, the idea of computational chemistry, the idea of quantum applied to protein discovery, uh, the idea of automation in the lab, that kind of those kinds of themes are becoming ever more prevalent and they mean that a lot of the perceptions that people had of life sciences entrepreneurship are, are wrong now they're, they're really wrong um i guess i'll make one last point which is that the, i think the most common misconception when looking at life sciences is that it's really it takes a very long time to get things to market and that makes it risky somehow and the reason why i think that misconception uh exists is because it's it's why well, it's true but the reason why people have wrongly taken that to mean that you shouldn't invest in those things is that <clears throat> they fail to see that value still accruing in those companies over the period that the, the research is being done in much the same way that value is accruing in a tech startup over the time where it's generating users and so if the company exits before it makes it to market in the case of a biotech it's still going to be a valuable exit whereas if it exit on the way to market as a tech company it's, it's, it's significantly less likely to be valuable um, there's far fewer assets of um, of intransient value in a, in a tech company at the point at which it's acquired, whereas a, a biotech is likely to have research and data and assets that can be used. So I think that's, I haven't particularly explained that very well, but <laughs> I, think, I think that's something that people miss. For you, like, are, are, there, are there books that you think about as being like really seminal and making you who you are? The two I think about most re- the thing the two that I think about that I've read most recently are Sapiens and Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, just because they change quite a lot about the way you think about <laughs> the world. I mean, Sapiens in terms of putting things in context and just the surprise that that wasn't something that was taught to us before. Uh, there was just so much about the human race I had no idea about, and I had the suspicion reading Sapiens that the reason they hadn't taught us about it was because it leads you to question the way everything is and that's really unhelpful if you're trying to keep things in order so uh, <laughs> i had that suspicion because it seems it seems if you're teaching people anything you should teach them the history of people so why didn't that get taught to us why did they get taught specifically about the romans specifically about the egypt the egyptians but not specifically about why why human institutions are the way they are uh, and it's not that it's really complicated i mean there's many ways in which it's more logical and straightforward than <laughs> egyptian history which is so so long and rambling and complex that um anyway so sapiens is one the problem i'm having here with this question is that i'm one of those people who uh, reads a book and then is obsesses about uh, obsesses about it and quotes it every day for a month and then almost completely forgets it um you're obviously not one of those people but i'm i think that the character trait is is monomania i think that's what people describe it as as and i uh, it's not actually that helpful <laughs> as a human because you you apply you apply one lens at a time rather than multiple lenses um things that that have stuck with me my my dad made me read a book called the painted bird by Jerzy kaczynski when i was uh 11 or 12 and it is not a book that many people read i think uh but it was absolutely scarring i think it was actually given to him to read while he was doing his undergraduate degree in psychology and it's about it's about a set of villages and the kind of horrendous practices. And it's, it's ruthlessly, explicitly sexual. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, that it's quite, it's quite weird to have that experience when you're like 11 and read something like that. But it, it changed the way I thought about things quite a lot. And, um, another book that I think about quite a lot is a child called it, which is about a child who was abused by his mother ruthlessly. And that's, Without realizing it, I was learning about gaslighting, I was learning about emotional and physical abuse, I was learning about survival through hardship, I was learning about the effect of formative psychological ex- experiences on an adult. The other book that um, has fundamentally shaped the way I think about politics is A Theory of Justice by John Rawls, and for anyone who studied politics and philosophy, that will be a common one. Um, this it's, it's a kind of landmark in my life in terms of the way I think about fairness, and if you're looking for a guide on working out what's fair, there's 
there's no I've never read a book that's more theoretically uh, sound in terms of understanding fair, like fairness as a universal concept as a theory of justice as as dense as it is. This will this uh, this question and how I phrase it will probably will not be put in for verba- ber- verbatim, but how do people go about raising money in trenches so that so that like the investor is satisfied with what they're doing? Like how do they like is that something that has an intrinsic motivation for people who are seeking an investment to add trenches in, or does it benefit them to not have trenches? And then if they do have trenches in, what should they be thinking about to ensure that they don't get like a bad tranche? I. I don't necessarily think it's a good idea to decide that you want tranched investment without doing that in the context of talking to a specific investor and in the context of their specific concerns with respect to your company. So say you're starting a company and you're constructing a, um, say uh, you're constructing a new kind of insect and there are several risk points and your investor that really fixates on the idea that maybe the insect that you develop is going to be a giant killer insect and, and, and it's going to blight society. You, you might you might decide you're going to tranche funding on proving that that's not going to happen, you know, so as to convince them, and then they'll be a little bit less concerned. And you use it, you can use it as part of the argument. Um, I, I think that's a good way of doing tranching is to identify where their insecurities are uh, as investors, and then say, look, if you don't think if you don't think we can do this, then tranche the funding on it, and um, and once we do it, then then we'll pr- proceed. And, and it kind of kills the argument. It also shows that you are really aware of the of the meaningful risk there and it's it's easier to make that kind of argument than to than to try and convince them that there's not a problem because you're <laughs> you, you're in a weird situation where you're they've identified a risk for you maybe one that you didn't identify for them and you're always going to have an agenda in making your argument to them that that's not a real risk so it's, it's sometimes better just to accept that it is a meaningful risk and tell them what you're going to do about it um, one of the things you might offer to do about it is to not take some of the funding until it's until it's until it's fixed. So I do it, I do it that way. I, I don't know exactly what you mean by a uh, a bad tranche. Um, the the only thing to be really careful of is that you don't run out of money. That's it. Yeah. So like if you accept a tranche, like they say, like show us that the fly will not kill other people, and there's like some tests they can do to do that. Like make sure that you know how much that's going to cost, and then add some like fluff in there. So, like, you don't undersell it because like, then you won't go to the next stage, and then you're kind of screwed. I don't, I don't. Like, I imagine if you you fall short, I don't know how you would address that. Do you, is there a is it possible to address that if you fall just short of something? Will people be like, oh, okay, and then they kind of work with it, or is it like a hard rule or a soft rule? If that made more sense, most of this stuff is dependent on the investors, and it wouldn't be it wouldn't be hard wired into the. It'll be written in in the terms, but it, it's unlikely to be written in such a way that. It's impossible to take the next round of fu- the next bit of funding without hitting that milestone. In the end, in the end, you don't want the tranche to be on something that if it if you don't get it, it doesn't matter. You want it to only be on a, on really critically important things that you are willing to not come back from. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense because if because because if you if you if you if you hit, don't hit, if you don't hit a milestone, but it's not important to to hit that milestone, that's the worst possible thing. So it's really important that you get you get them right. Because there are some cases where you don't hit it, but that's because you've learned something new about your business. And if it turns out that your investor is less reasonable than you realized, that can be fatal. <laughs> it's like, uh, and it's fatal because something wasn't important, which is not the way around you want it to be. Well, it's an interesting set of things to think about. I, I definitely like the idea of, you know, no, if you know what you're doing and you know the risk and you like speak to the risks as well as the reward, the benefits of doing something. And then you're like, hey, you know, you see this negative. If, you know, we agree, this is a concern, we're willing to trunch here, that kind of takes the wind out of their sails. And like you're saying, like it, it, it acknowledges the concern. And then pe- I think people are much more likely to believe someone when they recognize the negatives with the positives. Like if someone's trying to sell me something and they only say positives, I will not buy whatever they're selling me because I know there's negatives. Like there's always negatives, you know, like, you know, like there's always something that's bad. So you just got to kind of like look at it and, and be a believable source. There are two other things you can do with those kinds of risks. One is pitch them as a selling point because they mean that other people aren't going to enter the space. So yeah, we acknowledge that risk. That's exactly why no one else is doing this, but we've got this thing that's different. And the other thing to do is to quantify, in your mind, the chances of success in 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 in, surpass, in surpassing that risk and to do it in a really honest way. So to not have a list of risks where it's like 99% sure that you're definitely going to you know get past that risk, but to have somewhere actually you're really worried about getting them. And that puts you on the exact same side of the table as your investor because and you start thinking about it as as a team and they 
they may have resources or connections that help you get through those. So those I've seen those two things work really effectively in in as you say taking the wind out of someone's sails, but but better bringing them bringing them around to to look at it from exactly your perspective. And it has the benefit of making the conversation potentially no matter what a positive result, even if they don't invest with you. But if you kind of like show them these concerns and then like give you like, hey, you know, these are things you haven't thought about or like, like they poke holes in ways that are different than what you're thinking. Then you can go to the next, you know, the next investment meeting or the next business meeting with your with your partners and be like, hey, we didn't notice this glaring, giant, gaping hole in our dam. Let's work on this because, you know, we're not going to be a sound business without it. Like definitely try to take it as an opportunity. So when it came to finding the founders that you guys wanted to invest with. How did you, how did you guys you know hunt for them for lack of a better term and then decide which ones were the ones that were going to make the most impact? So there's two, there's two questions there, right? And so that's why I got this right. One is how did we find possible candidates, and then second of all, how did we make decisions to select? Them? Okay, so um, yeah, I think it's a great question and it gets to the heart of what was really difficult about what we were trying to do, which is to predict whether or not somebody's going to have a really good idea and then when they have that idea, um, whatever it may be, uh, whether or not they're going to be able to build a really exciting company around it. Um, and the reason why most people make a make a decision later on, once someone's already had an idea, is because you can tell whether or not that person is a good fit for that idea, and that's a kind of critical component of it. And if you don't do that piece of work, you don't have that idea, you're, you're making a bet on their ability to come up with an idea that they, in particular, are well positioned to build something around. Um, so the way we went around looking for people is, uh, very like very fortunately, I had a great network through my work at Imperial College, so I started there. So I'd, I'd spoken to part of the motivation for the is I'd spoken to a large number of people who were exceptionally smart, but who had ideas that were probably not the best ideas that they could think of. And so there was a sense of we had unfairly not chosen to work with those people because they hadn't come up with good ideas, and that reflects the reliance on serendipity and the kind of rate of false negatives you get in. A normal accelerator program where you're filtering by ideas because those those could be incredible founders they might just not have had the right idea yet and you're kind of relying on them to be in the right environment to come up with interesting ideas and there's, there's no reason why the environment they're in a phd or a, um, a, a mechanical engineering degree is going to be the exact right forum for that and um, so i used that network in the first place we also went directly to um administrators in different universities we ran lots of events we asked for referrals from our friends. Um, we started a massive social media campaign. We ran hackathons, um, and I, I, I had about I had about 25 to 30 phone calls a week during the first couple months, where I was just constantly in calls with with people. And at the end of every call, I'd ask people, you know, are there another two or three people that you refer me on to? And, and that always worked. And so we got we got hundreds and hundreds of applications in that first phase. Um, in the first year in total, we got around two and a half thousand applications. Wow. And it was just you and, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it was just you and Hammond at this point? So you guys went through 200,000 applications alone? We had a couple of uh, people come and help us. So actually, what happened is a couple of the people that we decided we'd like to do the program early on, they'd finished their PhDs already, and they were at a loose end. So we hired them as interns to come and help us build the program until it started. <laughs> so uh, that was kind of the advantage of having that that set of people, as we had a chance to um, work with some of them ahead of time and, and make use of their entrepreneurial abilities and their intelligence. So that helped. Um, but yeah, effectively it was it was us just filtering things, and we we had um, a, a set of levels of, of filtering. So there's minimum quite like uh, eligibility for the program. Are they able to join at the time when we want them to join? Uh, do they have the level of qualification in the right degrees? Have they done something or anything that indicates that they might be well positioned for this program? And then what we did for the hard part, which is the making the, the decisions part, is we made a list of all of the best entrepreneurs we, we knew well, and we made a list of all the characteristics that we could find in the literature that were supposedly indicative of entrepreneurial capability. So we read solidly for the preceding uh, six to 12 months, trying to find out what, what possible candidates for predictive efficacy and entrepreneurial capability we could find. And then we, we scored all the people that we knew against those characteristics based on our experience of them. And then we picked out the cast characteristics that had the greatest predictive efficacy of success. And then we used those in filtering candidates. And then and in the subsequent cohort, we 
we looked back at those characteristics to see whether or not for our particular program those characteristics had been helpful and we revised them from from the based on the score we got at the end of the program versus the score we gave them at the beginning to see whether or not we were making successful appraisals on those characteristics and or whether or not those characteristics were useful um, and we, we've done that a couple of times since um, and it's now We've now got a semi-automated system for doing that. So when you apply, you, you, it comes through to our back end and, and you, you have a kind of rough score and we can review uh, on that basis. There's a kind of like slight insight into the, it's a quite convoluted process, but we couldn't think of a better way of doing it because there's so much um, nonsense in the literature about and survivorship bias in the literature in what what makes good entrepreneurs. No, it, the as Mark Twain said, I'm sorry for the long letter. I didn't have the time to write you a short one. So like you guys are doing a, a lot, so it makes sense that <clears throat> like it's not convoluted, like and, and, and or, or doesn't make sense. Like your your process does make a, a lot of sense, and so which makes me ask the question: after doing this a couple times, and kind of like, which I really like the idea of filtering through and using experience and research to like build a better system to finding people, because like then you can find people that no one would find, and then which and then you then you bring them in. And then you make even more of an impact because maybe that person's like the next Einstein or something. I always, I always wonder about the people who get who fall through the cracks all the time. But the so what are the what are the characteristics that seem to resonate out that have been kind of proven out to, to for lack of a lot better term? This is probably something that I can't talk too much about because it's sort of uh, the thing that we've spent so much time working out, and it gives us a, a significant competitive advantage. Uh, just to say some of the things that people expect are are there but one of the things that we've realized is that it isn't actually that there's a definitive list it's that there's a, there's a, there's a set of capability those people those people need to have and there are a set of characteristics individual characteristics that allow them to do those capabilities and it could be any one of those characteristics that facilitates that capability and I can give you uh, I can give you one example so one thing is that the person has to be able to build a really big company that's a capability they have to have and there's a number of individual characteristics that allow them to possibly do that one is that they could be exceptionally passionate about a single thing and that drive is what's going to lead them to build something really big no matter what or it could be that they've got this incredible experience in building really really big companies do you see what i mean and, and, and so and so you don't need both necessarily because if you are really passionate about that one thing and we can retrofit that experience, then what you have is the potential to build something really big. And so, and that's what we're looking for. And so that's the kind of, um, I think the most significant learning point for us is that it was about capabilities rather than characteristics. And most people, when they filter applicants, are looking for, are looking for specific characteristics, X years in industry, X skills, um, is passionate, you know, um, but it's, it's not, it's not, it's not a tick box exercise. It's a multiple choice. It kind of reminds. I do not know why. Why I do know why this is popping up. It kind of reminds me of epigenetics, where like the environment is a key indicator of what our genetic makeup looks like. And, but I'm not going to go down that line. I remembered. I remembered the the right history book. It's Livy, the early history of Rome. So if you, it's a really nice book. It's well written, well written. But yeah, I'm writing that down. I think the epigenetics point more insightful than you realize, for several reasons. Firstly, because when you're looking for potential, you're looking, you're trying to look at whether or not the things that a person's achieved have been enabled or disabled or suppressed by the environment they've been in. So that's one sign of potential, right? You're, you're trying to you're trying to compare what they've achieved to the opportunity they had to achieve it. And uh, I think we, we we typically over uh, we overweight actual progress and underweight the advantages that a person had in order to reach those pro that progress. And the second thing is that once they're in a program like DSV, the environment that you create for that person has a huge impact on their potential for success. And there's a lot of evidence that actually individual characteristics are far less important than environmental characteristics. So the quality of the team that they're in, the advice and inspiration that you give them, you know, those are massively leveling. And if you give people the wrong sort of support and advice, the wrong 
strong sort of environment and team, it's the difference between selecting an outlier, incredible founder, and a, and someone who's never going to be able to do it. It's it's as powerful. So again, I think that's probably underweighted, and it's something that we're that we're spending a lot of time investigating at the moment. Speaking of outliers, this is a, another book. They there was this speaks exactly to your point. There was Oppenheimer, the guy who worked on the Manhattan Project. When he was in college, he stabbed a professor, and he talked his way out of it, right? And he went on to run the Manhattan Project. There was another person equally gifted, but his college, like he lived a really far away from the college, and he wanted to work out a way to move closer or what have you, but the college basically didn't give a crap, so he couldn't go to college. And now he lives on a ranch and, like, does – but his IQ is, like, off the charts. Like, he's equally as intelligent, but he was – like kind of like deny that opportunity to some extent. And so it's interesting to see how an environment, like one, you know, one switch, like someone wants to work with Oppenheimer and Oppenheimer is pretty smart at like talking people into doing things. He gets to, he gets to stab a professor and can't continue on <laughs> with his day. But one guy, he lives too far away until they drop him. So it's, it's interesting how, how like those smallest things can change people's, but it would, it would have been really great to hear of the other guy who kind of like got dropped, come back and still do great things. I think that would kind of like echo your point of like, well, even given environmental conditions, are you able to uh, go above them? Like if there's an adversity of being dropped by the college, we're bound from it. But yeah, if you want another book, that's a good one. What book was that? Outlier by Malcolm Gladwell. Oh, by Gladwell. Okay. I remember it because you, you, you said outliers I was like oh god that, that that reminds me of these this story that kind of echoes your point really well um that guy's really smart the well i just think it's crazy that oppenheimer could stab someone and get away with it uh and then <laughs> yeah let's give him the nuclear fissionable materials that that's smart <laughs> i do want to hear more about that and i also want to know whether or not they knew did they know oh they knew the, the, go, the government knew. They, they knew he was a communist, just, just leaning, and they, they allowed it because they were like, we're fighting Nazis right now. We're not fighting the, the communists yet. So I, I, think, I think one thing is people like, people like DSV, we, we, we're trying to find inflection. We're trying to find someone who's undervalued. That's the, the whole game. And so uh, if you can find something in the environment that would lead people to have the wrong opinion of someone, then you're finding a secret, you know, to, to use teal, to use teal's language. You're finding something secret that other people aren't seeing. Uh, and so when Oppenheimer stabbed someone, it, it, that's probably going to be the headline that you, that you read when you're thinking about Oppenheimer. And so if you're looking for the guy who's going to make the difference and um, that you're going to see a huge uptick on from, from selection to, to, to result, it's probably him. Uh, I mean, Oppenheimer was probably going cheap at that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I... You clearly he was gifted, but it's just it's just interesting. And then, yeah, adversity is a weird thing. <laughs> I don't know. He was a hothead, but not to get away from what we're talking about. The I think one of the one of the big things that we wanted to talk about was this idea that we're we're kind of like echoing back and forth as we as we talk, which is that there are people in this world with with great potential and they're overlooked either because they're early on in their career or for a variety of reasons. And I think this pulls to a quote, which is, I forget who says it, it might be Benjamin Franklin who said that the greatest repository of innovation and knowledge resides not in a library or the internet, but rather the grave because people don't take their shot or give them their shot or, whatever that reason is they take it with them to the to the grave and instead of making the world a better place they just kind of you know take it with them to say that statement three times so i think that that was one of the key things that we wanted to talk about like this like yeah i i, I think i think to, to re to rephrase that quote the greatest loss of potential and creativity and innovation lies in people's second career i think in their in their late thirties, in their late twenties, early thirties, I think probably that's where m most potential for innovation and creativity goes to die. Uh, because I think so many, I think there's like a short window where you're still you're still optimistic about what's possible. You still have the energy, you still have the lack of attachment, you still have the freshness of of vision to reinvent something. 
Uh, and that gradually fades and is kind of crushed out of you as you see other people kind of failing to, to do that because it, inevitably you, you witness and experience all of the things that can go wrong. And that accumulation of factors that gradually will suck your desire to, to, to do something new out of you and change your brain chemistry, actually. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's something I'm particularly interested in is how we can stop that loss of innovation at that point by kind of seeing through experience and gray hair as the only indicator of potential success in innovation is at the moment that's, that's how it feels the way that people think so if you're um if you're a set of three operators who've built successful companies before even if you're just at concept you're far more likely to raise a series a straight off the bat than if you're a series of uh, early career scientists and engineers who've got this incredible idea you know that's very very well thought through and you've got early commercial traction you know, the progress that you've made will be, and the, and the, the innovation and the concept will be far less valued than the experience and dem- demonstrable proof that the, that the uh, experience team has. And that's kind of what I, I talk about unorthodox scientific founding teams being these early career researchers who, are, who want to reinvent something. And I'm super passionate about the, the, the kind of gap there. And I think it's in a way, without going too long about this, I, I think it's, it's very analogous to, to the way that people perceived um, young computer scientists in in the early 90s, right, and the, and the late 80s, there was that perception that they were incapable of building successful companies, and, and over time that has been proven wrong. It's been proven that you don't need to be really old to build a really exciting business model or brand new technology that's going to change the way that people live. In fact, it's actually probably a prerequisite of building a completely a novel way of doing something that that you haven't been exposed and inculcated with that with the, with the existing status quo. Or prior conceptions, or the or the endless litany of failed examples before. Yeah, that reminds me of this company. They were they were chef people. They're like they like worked on how to make food. I think it's called the Duck Factory or something. Like there's some animal in the name, and they they have a horizontal hierarchy because they found or they believe that when you promote people based on results of whatever they did, that you're you're basically reinforcing whatever that result is so if if you want innovation you want something new so that by definition is not something that was existing before so like what they do is they'll like kind of decide in team leads but then everyone drops back down to horizontal when after the mission so that new ideas can can churn up and you won't have like little political bodies within an organization around like keeping people at a certain level or like keeping jobs and so, like, it kind of, like, per- perpetuates the innovation because – at and this kind of goes to your point of this gray hair fallacy. Like, the people who who have done things to get to that level are going to continue to do those things to get to that level. And that's not to say that they can't do new things, but, like, it's, it's you know, what have they seen that is scary, that has failed when people try new things? And what have they seen that has, you know, given them things? And they're going to probably go with the thing that has given them things. So, like, young people don't know any better. <laughs> you know, they don't have that type of track record because everything's new and they have that hunger that you're talking about. And I think that's what you guys are trying to tap into. And and especially, I think I think it's very analogous to the, the 70s, like, nowadays with all the new biotech technology that's going on and how easily and more available it is. Like, it, I think this is this is a very exciting time to live in for, for biotechnology. I think this, I think the, the the general perspe- perspective is that biotech is different. If you talk to if you talk to investors in the space or later stage VCs, they'll say, you know, computer science companies they're not like biotech companies. A, a young founder can do a computer science company because it's straightforward, right? You just need to set up the application and scale it. Whereas in biotech, say you're, and particularly with pharmaceutical assets, say you've got to go through clinical trials, you have to know how to go through clinical trials. It's absolutely critical. And so and so age and experience in getting people through those very complex esoteric trials that you have to go through makes a massive difference there, and that's why it's no longer analogous. And the, I guess the retort is that we're not talking about whether or not the experience is required. We're talking about whether or not you bet on the founding team with a certain profile. So yes, you need experience and you need access to expertise in negotiating clinical trials. The question is, does that need to be in the founding team from day one? And it's the same with pretty much everything. Um, Yes, you need experience and expertise. Never, I never devalue or say that it's not. Requ- say, say, you know, there's a 
you know, people who are experienced are useless. It's, it's not that. It's that making early bets on the thing that's going to transform an industry, should you be looking for their ability to go through processes, fixed processes that are complex, or should you be looking for their ability to do something completely new? Um, and I love I love the example that you gave because the uh, idea that somebody who's done something before is, is capable of doing something completely new again that's that's a really interesting question. I mean, there's definitely evidence to suggest that if you've done something new before, you're capable of doing something new again. But it's, but it's not necessarily a direct correlation. It's not predictable. Yeah, and well, I think you can hire for experience. You know, like you can have a, a founding team with, you know, that that passion and that drive that are going to do the long hours to kind of gain that experience, and they can have advisors and stuff to offset that skill set. So like. It's it's more a thing to be considered of, I think, than to be concerned of. I I feel, but you know what do I know? <laughs> you know more. <laughs> I I mean I I'm in agreement on this. All right, then I do know more. I <laughs> I know enough. Um, so for people who you know have that young, excited type attitude, and they want to learn more, or they want to get into this, or they want they hear what you're doing and they're like hey you know i like finding companies and you know working with people like i like that i'd I'd enjoy doing that but um how how could they get into it like what should they be learning what what should they be doing networking with people you know anything that's a really really big question but like what would be your advice for people listening in that want to learn more and have the hunger and desire to learn more and to put themselves in a position to make a difference so the, the thing that surprises me is how few people know what they care about. So I think it's a really common question that um, experienced and experienced advisors or mentors will ask a founder, like, what 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 is it that you care about? What are you interested in? And and most and a lot of people won't be able to answer that question. And so my advice is, which with, with with respect to working out what you care about, and this is really. This is really trial and error, um, and it's it's similar to the way that people conduct lean startup methodology, right? So you have a hypothesis as to what you think you would be interested to work on, and then you go and test that hypothesis by spending a lot of time working on it until until you build up a a, a kind of mental map of what you're interested in and what you're not interested in. That's going to be the most valuable thing you can do when you're getting going because it acts as a guide for you in terms of how you spend your time. It acts as a way of turning down uh, distracting opportunities that arise because they will come up as you're doing this and they'll be way easier and better paid and they'll make you less anxious to think about. Uh, If you know exactly what you're interested in because you've done that experimentation and you've built that roadmap for yourself, then you can justify spending time going really deep on something. And it's, it's, it's that justification that it's going to allow you to build up an expertise in something and a speciality, and that's ultimately going to allow you to find interesting opportunities and new ideas in a space. So that's a system for kind of de-risking it personally. Because if, you just don't, if, you, if you've got a kind of broad idea, you want to work on something, you want to solve some sort of problem, you want to make an impact, you want to do something in science, you're going to get distracted, you're going to end up in another postdoc, you're going to end up working for a foundation as a research manager, you just, you're, going to end up, you're going to end up not working on building the thing that you wanted to build. So you've got to be really sure, and uh, it's worth investing the time to, to, to get that certainty. And the way that I would start conducting those hypotheses by talking to people who are building companies in the space, by talking to uh, multinationals to understand the process that they're going through in that product, um, to talk to researchers about the field, to read widely and deeply um, on, those, on those categories, and to build up kind of a personal file for that thing so that you're starting to, to get a feel, get a grip as to where the gaps and opportunities might be. And that, that skill in itself is going to be a repeatable exercise that you can do if and when you exhaust that, that as a possible avenue. Um, and I think, that's, I think it's basically the template for starting a company as well. So once you've picked something and you're, and you're building a company, you already know lean startup methodology because you've been doing it with your personal desires and interests. Uh, that's the kind of, if you are really ambitious and you're going to do something outside of an accelerator, I think you're going to be fine if you, if you, if you take that kind of approach. You don't really need anyone else. You can build your own mentorship network. You can find the investors who are specialists in that space relatively easily. If you're starting an accelerator program, you just email those people and say, I'm running an accelerator program. So if you're starting a company, you can do much the same thing on your own and you can probably do something tailored for yourself. Um, 
you don't even need to be sure that you're building something. They'll probably be more interested to help you because you're still foundational. And there's that kind of thrill of generating new ideas that's interesting. Yeah, I, I think it's the Lean Startup is is a book by Eric something, something, something. But Eric Weiss. I, yeah, there you go. The as a, as a uh, it's basically the scientific method for people who are like really science nerds. Like the, the process he goes through is like the repackaging of the scientific method, which is really fantastic that people can use it to build science companies. So I, I think that's for people who haven't checked out that book yet. You know, definitely do it. And then kind of like try and see how relatable it is to the scientific method because it it's pretty close. It's 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 an interesting factoid. And that's why and that's why it always shocks me when people say that scientists can't be founders or shouldn't be founders or inventors should step out of science companies. They <laughs> you know they spend their entire life on uh, working through an evidence based methodology, running experiments to try and get results, and making decisions on the basis you know allocation of resource decisions on the basis of those. Uh, of those experiments, and so to transition that into into a commercial context, it just takes a, like a couple of hours. <laughs> it just takes a couple of hours of mindset shift, and then you can see it. All right. So, in the final questions that we have, what are some specific? Because I think people really love kind of getting like a a sample of things to check out, books. It, it can be related to what we're talking about. It can be not related. Books, resources. Because the there's there's so much out there. Then kind of like limiting it down to things that you enjoy I think would be very beneficial to other people so what are what are some recommendations you would have so I'm going to give you a disappointing answer to this I I've I've been looking back through the books I've read recently and I've been trying to work out which books don't fall foul of either the fact that social psychology isn't repeatable and largely isn't repeatable in a in entrepreneurship either you know they, they they will run a test with a sample size and then it's impossible to find someone having reproduced that experiment. A lot of Kahneman's work, for example, in Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, hasn't been reproduced anywhere. And a lot of studies he's quoting were on small samples that no one has been able to recreate outside of the US, for example. And the second thing is that if they don't fall foul of the non-reproducibility of social psychology, they sometimes, they often fall foul of um, the survivorship bias that people necessarily have when they're looking for examples of best practice. If you listen to Tim Ferriss, or read the books of Tim Ferriss, they, they, if you read them with a filter of is does this fall foul of survivorship bias, they always, always do. And so really, really hard to take them seriously because you want to know if two people follow the strategy, will that strategy be the determining factor in their success? Or is, there, is it a set of external factors that are not included in this study or this experiment or this case study that actually were determining success? And so un- unfortunately, uh, I've, I've stopped recommending books about entrepreneurship because I don't think I don't think there's a lot of good I don't think there's a lot of good uh, evidence out there. Well, we got to write that book then. We'll, uh, we'll <laughs> I'll uh, I'll distribute it. I guess I'll, I'll put it on my podcast. Like guys, check out Dom's book. We'll we'll have it'll take you know it'll take years, maybe ten years, but you know who cares? <laughs> we'll start now. So look, let, let me let me let me do something. That there are there are a set of academics who I think are really exciting. So um, I'll give you one who I who I can vouch for as his work being really interesting and rigorous and still like readable because <laughs> sometimes those are mutually exclusive. Um, and that's Justin Berg over at Stanford, and he's writing about basically um, the ways in which people come up with ideas and the way that we judge ideas. And he's running he's running randomized control trials on that stuff. To work out what factors are predictable, uh, or have predictable efficacy in working out whether or not an approach to coming up with an idea is going to come up with an innovative idea or not, and also what approach to forming a judging panel is going to lead to judgment towards the ideas that are most likely to succeed. And I think his experimental approach to understanding um, ideation is one of the few where the sample sizes are big enough and the methodology looks tight enough that um, I died by it. Although he he sometimes ends up because because it's difficult to get that methodology to be what he ends up with some str- strange case studies which might not generalize. So for example, there's one in which he works with a circus trying to predict whether or not circus acts are going to be um, popular with audiences, and it's hard to tell whether or not that generalizes. But I thought the construction was beautiful. That's really fascinating. I have not heard of that person, 
Thank you. I love finding new little like niche. I, I prefer, I don't mind if it's readable as long as it's factually accurate. And that methodology, you know, like if you can have the, the construction of how they got to their conclusions, then you can like break down anything. So, yep. which is logic, I think. I think the one, the one that I really liked was called, it's something like walking along the creative high wire, something like that. And um, that's a really good paper. All right, I'm writing down real quick. Long, uh, high wire. All right, so for people who have heard about Deep Science Ventures, heard about Dom, and they want to learn more, because you guys have, I like, this is for everyone who's listening, check out the website he's about to say. I mean, it's Deep Science Ventures, I just said it for you, but the, there's so much great blog content on there about these subjects, but for, for people who would like to learn more, how could they learn more, even though I kind of answered? Yeah, I mean, I, I would check out the website. Um, deepscienceventures.com um, we're actually just about to relaunch our website with loads more content uh, because there just wasn't enough content on the old website so, so um, yeah that's what <laughs> so um, but that's probably the best way and if you're really interested and you think you might have the kind of what it takes to start a science company with us you don't need an idea you don't need any pre-existing intellectual property you don't need a team then you can get in touch with me directly and i um, uh, happy to provide my email I guess in the text for the podcast does it have to be in the London, UK region, or can it be all the EU, or can it be the United States as well? It could be pretty much anywhere other than North Korea, Turkmenistan, or Belarus at the moment, because we can sponsor Tier 1 Entrepreneurship Visa to relocate to London if you want to, and because we're also working with people um, in a completely online way as well. So um, we're building companies in a decentralized way. So one of our companies, for example, has a team member in London, a team member in Paris, and a team member in Seattle. Um, another has one in Cambridge, one in Wales, and one in uh, Berlin. So, yeah, you could be anywhere. Excellent. Then, um, I think that's a, a great way to leave off on the podcast. We got to, we got to talk about so much today. Deep Science Ventures. How Dom and Hammond got to start the 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 the, the company, for lack of a better term, and great advice for people who are looking to to get into this type of line of work. So, I want to thank you for coming out. And this is really fantastic. I, I enjoyed this conversation. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening today. Please subscribe, leave a review, check out our website, learningwithlowell.com, or join my mailing list. I'm here to learn and share what I learn. New episodes every Tuesday, new emails every Monday, and I blog on topics that I find fascinating.